there are two goals for today's lesson. The first goal is to use the quadratic formula to solve for x. The second goal is to use something called the discriminant as a tool to decide two things, the number and type of solutions you will have for a quadratic equation. So quadratic formula is the first half. The tail end of the lesson is all about the discriminant. So two things you're going to be able to, to learn how to use today. So with that being said, uh, you may have done the quadratic formula before. Uh, step one is to make sure your quadratic is written in standard form. Uh, you will notice that regardless of if the quadratic has a rational or irrational, real or imaginary solution, for you after today, every quadratic equation is going to be able to be worked out to figure out what those answers for x might be. When in doubt, this is always going to work out. Uh, the first thing you're going to want to notice is that uh, here's your quadratic equation in standard form, right? Just to review that, ax squared plus bx plus c. And when we use this formula, we're actually setting y equal to 0. When we let y equal 0, if we're thinking about the way this will affect the rest of our chapter, which is graphing parabolas, when we let y equal 0, we're actually finding x-intercepts, places where the graph crosses the x-axis. So if you think about letting y equal 0, we now have to solve for x. And the quadratic formula is a formula that helps you do that. I have a song. Some of you know the song. You can feel free to sing it with me because I am a horrible singer. But it goes like this. x equals negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So there's that. There's rigor. Yeah. If you haven't memorized this one yet, it is a big one. You should memorize it. Uh, there's going to be a bonus opportunity. I'll offer it up at the end of class for you to show where this formula comes from. Um, in example one right here, though, before we get to all that, we have 3x squared plus 1 equals 5x. Well, this equation isn't set equal to 0. Uh, so the first thing you're going to want to do is write that equation in standard form and set it equal to 0. That's step 1. Step 1. Set it equal to 0. There's another method that starts in this way. Do you remember which one it is? Factoring. Very good. So yeah, you would go ahead and, and also set one side equal to 0 when you're using that factoring approach too. So if I do that, I get 3x squared minus 5x plus 1 equals 0. And when I look at that, a is 3, b is negative 5, and c is 1. So these are the a's, the b's, and the c's that I can go ahead and plug into my quadratic formula. So I have x equals negative blank plus or minus square root. Whoops. b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Now you're probably saying, why are you opening up all those parentheses, Mrs. Lucas? And I will go ahead and answer that question for you. Uh, some of you still lean on your calculator pretty heavily. If you forget the parentheses, especially around your negatives, your calculator will mess up your day. So it's my recommendation that if you're a person who leans on your calculator a little bit, uh, that you use parentheses with caution. Now I'm going to go back through the formula, and I'm going to go ahead and plug in my b values there. So I have x equals negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And typically my honors algebra 2 students kind of look at this in three pieces. We have that piece to simplify. We have to simplify that product down there. We also have to worry about this radical right here. The opposite of negative 5 is 5, so that's not too, too bad. And then the product of 2 and 3 in the bottom is 6. Now I need to solve for what's underneath that radical. And that value underneath the radical, that's actually the tail end of our lesson today. That b squared minus 4ac, that's actually what we call our discriminant. So right now I need to evaluate the discriminant. And when I evaluate the discriminant, I use the order of operations. So I'm going to go ahead and 
there's nothing that can be done in those parentheses right there. They're already simplified. Parentheses, then exponents. I do see exponents. I have to square negative 5. Squaring a negative 5, that's negative 5 times negative 5. That's always going to produce a positive value. So I do often see a mistake with this first part right here. This first value, b squared, that's always a positive number because you're squaring the whole value of b. I wouldn't subtract next. No, no, I wouldn't. I bring down the minus. Order of operations says you have to multiply next. So I do 4 times 3 times 1, that's 12. And then I can subtract. So I have 5 plus or minus the square root of 13 all over 6. And what I'm asking myself right now is can I simplify any of that? Can I simplify the square root of 13? Can I reduce anything out of all the factors that I see? The answer to that is no. So this does give me my two answers to my quadratic equation. I have x equals 5 plus the square root of 13 all over 6. And I also have 5 minus the square root of 13 all over 6. Questions about that? Okay. Now, all I want you to do is just try part A for me. Let's make sure you can use this quadratic formula. So thank you for that. Can you give me your answer for this independent practice problem? Where you stopped, it'd be fine. X equals one plus or minus square root of negative Yeah, and that's kind of where I expected you guys to stop because we haven't talked about explicitly what do you do with this? Like, how do you proceed? So we talked about it within the context of, of number 27 there. I don't know if you remember going over that problem a little bit. But we're going to make this official today. And I have to give you a definition real quick. Uh, today we actually get to define for the first time the imaginary unit, or i. And i is defined in this class. It has a value. It's equal to the square root of negative 1. And we could use this fun fact to help us simplify when our radicand is negative. So here's how you do that. Uh, in example two, we're going to practice just simplifying a couple of negative radicands. So here I'm going to go ahead and take the square root of negative 25. I know that negative 25 quite simply is just the product of negative 1 times 25. I can now use my product property of radicals to simplify this. The square root of negative 1, we know what that is. That's i. And then the square root of 25, you know what that is too. That's 5. We don't really write our answer like that, however. It's not i times 5. We'd write it as 5i. Let's try this again, a little bit tougher this next time. The square root of negative 75, the first thing that catches my eye is that negative. That's like a red flag every time I see it. And when I think about the square root of negative 75, I actually think of that as the product I think of negative 75, rather, as the product of negative 1 times positive 75. I can now use my product property of radicals to simplify this. The square root of negative 1, you know what that is. That's just i. The square root of 75, that actually simplifies now. I don't know if you remember doing that or not. Hopefully you do. That breaks down into 25 times 3, and you square root each piece. So this is like i times 5 times the square root of 3. Well, you don't really write it like that either. We actually would write this as 5i times the square root of 3. So real similar to what we did in part A, we just tag that radical onto the end. Let's do it again. Square root of negative 800. So I first think about it as the product of negative 1 times 800. I then take the square root of each of those pieces using my product property for radicals. The square root of negative 1, you know what that is. That's i. And then the square root of 800 breaks down to 400 times 2. 400 is the largest perfect square factor of 800. Sure, you could have pulled out a 4, but you would have been there a while simplifying. You could have pulled out 100. You would have just had to go a couple more steps. 
So if I just pick out the largest perfect square factor of 800, it, it goes a little quicker. Square root of 400 is 20. And the square root of 2, that's an irrational number. That's just the square root of 2. So I don't really write this as i times 20 root 2. I'm actually going to write this as 20i root 2. You want to try part E? Go ahead and let you try that. One. See if you did it right. Some of my students will pick 9 there. Remember, you want to try to pick the largest perfect square factor. Okay, there's i. We don't really write it like that. 6i squared is a 2. Did you get it right? Yeah, lots of nodding. Anybody have any questions about it? What's up, Dylan? Um, it has to go back to the, the whole definition of standard form. We have a, I, I kind of gave you a little snapshot there. That is, for instance, an answer written uh, in standard form. That's the standard form for a complex solution. You list out your real part over there, and then plus or minus your imaginary part. And it's just sort of tradition. We just write things in decreasing order of exponents, because that's how you're supposed to write an answer for a polynomial. We never leave square roots on the bottom of a fraction, because that's just, that's just part of our language that we speak in math class. So it's just the standard form. Um, okay, so with the, <laughs> I, we're finally coming back full circle. Uh, with regard to example three, you'll see we have 2x squared minus 6x equals negative 7. Looks familiar, right? That was that last problem that you worked on maybe on your warm-up. And you're like, oh, it doesn't factor. So what's nice is that you do get to see that there's still a way to solve that problem. And, and that way, one of those ways would be just that quadratic formula. So you're going to take some time right now to set it equal to zero and to set this particular equation equal to zero I'm just going to add seven to both sides and so I notice my a value is two my b value is negative six there my c value is seven. and then I do x equals negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus four a C all over 2a. And then I'll go back through and fill those in. C equals negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And then we usually take care of this piece and this piece straight out of the gate. Negative negative 6 is 6. 2 times 2 is 4. And now I need to simplify the value of the discriminant, that b squared minus 4ac. I have to do exponents first. Negative 6 times negative 6 is 36. 4 times 2 times 7 is 56. And then I'm like, whoa, look at that. That's square root of negative 20. So from this point forward, you can't just leave that as an answer. You're now expected to simplify that. So it's at this point in time I'll often see my, my honor students, they just grab the square root of negative 20 and they do a little scratch work off to the side, really similar to what we just did in example two. You break it down into negative one times 20 and then you square root each piece. The square root of negative one, that's just i. And then the square root of 20 is just two root five. So we actually can just swap out the square root of negative 20 with 2i root 5. Now what's nice, just to go back to Dylan's question from earlier, if you write this in standard form, uh, you'll see that something kind of pops out of the problem that's important in helping us write our answer in lowest terms. So in putting that 2 out in front, you might see that there's a common factor now in all three terms. Do you see it? There's something that each of these pieces have in common. Hence the term common factor. Do you see those three pieces? Alyssa. Yeah, and I can reduce that two out. I have to reduce this fraction all the way down. So I'm going to go ahead and, and put this fraction in lowest terms by reducing out the factor of two. 
the common factor of two. So two goes into four twice, two goes into six three times, two goes into two once. So the best way to write our answers for this is to do three plus i root five over two, and then three minus i root five over two. Questions about how to do this with imaginary numbers? You guys are good. Our complex solution there. Okay, so now, uh, I did say there's two parts to our lesson today. We're now moving into part two, the discriminant. And the discriminant, like I said, is a tool, an awesome, awesome tool that helps us determine basically two things. Uh, it helps us determine the number and type of solutions that a quadratic will have. So when you think about that b squared minus 4ac, that number that you get under there, that number is, is called the discriminant. If this number is positive, you may have noticed that you're getting two real solutions. Well, on a parabola, this has meaning. That means that this particular parabola will cross the x-axis in two places. So you'll have two x-intercepts. If the value of your discriminant is equal to zero, then you really only get one real solution. If you think about it, you'd be taking the square root of zero, which is zero, and then you know, you'd have your opposite of your b plus or minus zero. Well, that would just be your plus or minus b, or your, I'm sorry, your, your negative b value. Uh, these happen more commonly when you do your perfect square trinomials. You might remember those, your PSTs. Um, when you factor those, you get the matching set of parentheses, and you only get one answer. Well, well those parabolas only have one x-intercept. So they have one real solution, one x-intercept. Well, check out what happens if your discriminant is negative. That means that you're going to have to try to take the square root of a negative number. Right? Well, in that case, you get two imaginary solutions. And how this plays out on a parabola, that equation can't equal zero. You're not going to have any x-intercepts because we couldn't let y equal zero and get real numbers back out at least. So you get no x-intercepts out of that. If you have imaginary solutions, we can't plot those on a real number line. They have their own different coordinate system that you'll take care of next year. So with that, um, we are going to go ahead and practice using the discriminant. The goal behind using the discriminant, again, is to determine the number and type of solutions a quadratic will have. So it's not like you always have to work the whole problem out to figure out how many solutions there are. You could just do b squared minus 4ac. Nice. So let's try it. In part A, we're asked to use the discriminant to determine the number and type of solutions you'll have. So I'm going to do my b squared minus 4ac. And in this problem, that'll be 6 squared minus 4a, which is 1, and c, which is 5. So I have 36 minus the product of 4 times 1 times 5 minus 20. That's 16. And I know that 16 is a number that's bigger than 0, making my discriminant positive. So what we get there is two real solutions. Now over here, if I do my b squared minus 4ac, I know I have 6 squared again. a is 1 and c is 9. Well, this is just 36 minus 36. We get 0. Well, zero is equal to zero, which means we get one real solution. That's a perfect square trinomial. Do you see that? It's factored to be x plus 3x plus 3. You would have one x-intercept at negative 3. In the last case, process of elimination, I'm thinking we're getting a negative discriminant. Let's check it out. So we have b squared minus 4ac. So b squared is 6 squared minus 4 times 1 times 13, 
Oh my goodness, 36 minus 52. That is definitely less than zero. So we get no real solutions, but rather two imaginary solutions. And now your conclusion. I want you to practice using the discriminant to determine the number and type of solutions a quadratic will have for A and B. And then, without peeking, I want you to draw a parabola that would have two real solutions, draw a parabola that would have one real solution, and draw one that would have no real solution. Uh, you might notice that we're now bridging the gap into graphing parabolas, which is what we take care of not next week, but the week after. When we get back together on Wednesday, we're going to review all of our methods for solving, and we're going to do that for two days. So Wednesday and Thursday next week are review days, and then Friday is your test. I should give you a little clarification on your homework tonight, too, while you're working on your conclusion. Your assignment for tonight, you should read the assignment sheet quite carefully. There's a chunk of problems on that assignment uh, where you have to do each problem twice. It's not a typo. This is one of the assignments that comes back and is quite often awarded partial credit because of that one section. Make sure you read those directions carefully. There's not very many of those problems, but they ask you to do the quadratic formula and then verify it with factoring. You should, when you work out the problem twice using both methods, you should get the same answer. And there is value in that. I want you to make that comparison. See which one's faster. That's also important because that'll help you finish your test quickly and efficiently in the 40 minutes you're supposed to. So just to clarify, you want to make sure you read your assignment sheet for tonight very, very carefully. So let's take a look at number 1A. Looks good as I look around. How many solutions are there and what type for 1A? Go ahead, Sean. One real solution, very good. What about part B? B squared minus four AC. What do you think, Doug? It was two real solutions because you got a positive discriminant. Very, very good. Joey, what's your question, bud? Well, I thought I did. Does anybody know what type of line the x-axis is here? Touches it, ooh, one point. Don't know why that happened. Touches it exactly one point and keeps going on. What is that called? Do you remember, Dylan? What is it? No, that is the vertex. That's the point. I'm talking about the x-axis is what type of line. Next. Tangent line, very good. So that our solution do you know what that point is called besides the vertex? Point of tangency. Yes, very good. And then no real solutions. Woo! No x-intercepts. This will be super, super duper important when we get back together. Like, I feel, I want to say like next week, but that's not right because we only have three days together next week. So it'll be the week after. We're going to start graphing parabolas. And this solving is a really important skill to help you find these x-intercepts. Okay.